feel like I pocket out do everything. <laughs> like, sorry, I like set up the book the room, set up the venue, yeah. order the food, then like Michael helped the presentation, and then also with my computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this okay, Microsoft has more people than me, trust me. Um but it's just that my team only has myself um on developer relations for the region. So uh yeah. Um, okay, so can we just like since it's a pretty small crowd, given that it's COVID also the situation, um, please feel free to like if you want to spread out yourselves. Actually, we did spread out the seats so you can sit one seat away from each other. Social spacing, our ministers have done it. If you want to do it too, feel free. Don't feel awkward. So I'm just going to say as a baseline so no one feels like, oh, I don't want to offend the person next to me. If you really want to move, just move. It's okay. As like, you can see, Edison's yeah, all the way there. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, and also the other thing is that since it's a pretty small crowd, I was just thinking maybe we can all just say hi and say our names because um, I presented larger crowds before, but if it's a smaller crowd, I find it even more pressure actually. And I don't actually, this is my first junior deaf meetup. Um, I know some of you know each other, but I don't know any of you. So if you just want to say hi, can we just go around the room? It will help me a lot. So hi, my name is Sarah. I'm from Microsoft. Michael, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Michael. I'm Gov <laughs> Uh, I'm Inshu from Carousel. I'm Max from Kosherex. Hi, I'm Isha from Google. I'm Abel from SP Google. I'm Michael from Sciences. I'm Kristina from Data. Hi, I'm Hani, I just graduated from the US. I'm Gabriel from Police Hot. Ooh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Xavier, I'm being a coding cat. Jeff from Call Levels. And I'm <coughs> Vincent from Mercury's. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, nice to meet all of you. Thanks for spending Friday night with us. Um, today, I am sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll stay in one spot. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so tonight actually just uh, when Michael was talking about junior dev, I was thinking like if you're starting out as a developer, um, these are just some things that I see across the things that I've covered in the developer relations space that I think are really good considerations to think about. And hopefully like when you start building your own solutions, these are things that you can consider as you build them. And of course things will change. Um, I think in the space of the ethics, diversity and inclusion, uh, things change with the evolving conversation and it evolves really, really quickly. Like you can see sustainability has picked up so quickly in the past two years. So anything I say today will probably be irrelevant in the next six months. So all I do is just encourage all of you to keep reading up. Um, I'll start off with this slide. So um, we actually had a community event virtual conference uh, last Saturday on March 7th, um, where we had multiple communities come together. And we actually invited one of our philanthropy leads. Uh, her name is Diana, and she actually talked about how um, we can use AI for good. So one of her slides that I thought was actually really interesting was around this question, uh, could we see a Hippocratic Oath for developers like we have for doctors? So uh, just for context, Hippocratic Oath again is to prevent doctors from doing any harm to their patients, especially given that the power that they hold as a doctor for the patient. Similarly, developers with tech being even more like prevalent everywhere, it's really important on how we're going to use it for good and some of the considerations like what you can do versus what you should do. So um, this is just something I'll leave you with. Um, okay, next slide. So, yeah, sorry, I'm my subtitles like killing everything. Okay, it's okay, I'll read through. Basically, the title is like, who am I to be talking about this? Um, I'm actually not just like, not just because I'm capable about this whole space, because there's no actually like role in Microsoft that says you're the diversity and inclusion lead or like you're the lead for women at Microsoft. So why do I care so much about it and who am I to be able to tell you about this? Um, I'm actually just somebody that has just experienced quite a few things. Um, definitely, everyone, each of you have your own experiences, but I'll just share with you some of the things that I went through that have given me some ideas on what this can be about. Um, definitely, it's not the correct answer, but you'll definitely have your own response to that as well. So um, I'm Sarah Tiam. I'm a Senior Program Manager for Developer Relations at Microsoft. So I focus around the region at Asia Pacific. Um, in my time at Microsoft, I've done a lot of different things inside and outside of Microsoft that has allowed me to get a better view of just really tip of the iceberg around different communities as well. Um, I have done DigiGirls, which is a coding event to help girls learn how to code. Um, I'm also part of a very diverse and inclusive global team and a cloud advocacy team, which is why I'm the only one here, but my rest of my team sits in different areas around the world and we connect a lot remotely. Um, and there's a lot of considerations when you're doing a very globally diverse team as well. I uh, also volunteer outside with for underprivileged youth and there are a lot of things that I've seen there that I actually didn't know about, I didn't think about around how like, you know, system, like things are really systemic sometimes and there are considerations that you never think of and it's not so easy to say like, oh, if you just work hard, 
uh, you can make it. There are a lot of considerations as well that people go through, and I think when we develop solutions for that, there's something also to think about. Uh, also, part of the Women at Microsoft committee, to, I actually ran the Mentoring Circles activity previously, so that's where we address a lot of topics that women in tech face. Um, also, am um, leading the philanthropies charter in terms of employee engagement, so around like how do you get volunteers for different philanthropic activities. So it's pretty interesting, like, we do have underrepresented groups reaching out to us saying, like, can we use tech to help us to come up with a system that can better manage our databases or better manage the ways that we do a lot of admin processes so that we can actually focus on the main work and the important things here. So that, that gave me a good idea as well. And also lastly, I, I am an LGBTQIA plus ally um, helping out Ping Dot. We, we did try to get Microsoft's venue to help out Ping Dot last year. Um, yeah, so just that, that has given me really tip of the iceberg. Does not mean I'm an expert on all these, but having been through some of this has given me kind of an eye-opening experience as to things that we can think about as developers and when you are in tech as an industry. So um, just a really brief history of computer ethics, because when I was writing this, I was one of the things that hit me when um, we always talk about conversations of, I'm sure you, all of you have heard the term DNI so much, diversity and inclusion, you know, women in tech, equal pay, all these things. Um, sometimes I hear it so much that it becomes, it feels like some campaigns out there make it just a word and it's just, it doesn't have meaning behind it. And sometimes I feel like it gets a bit lost. Um, and so I question myself, like, what, what's the history of it? You know, where did it come from? And so I did a bit of reading up. Um, just to share with you what I have learned via a search engine <laughs> search. Uh, in the 1940s, it really started right there when um, this person called Norbert Weiner actually wrote a book around, um, he didn't call it computer ethics, he actually called it um, a theory around what happens if, if you know, computers as a system, because all systems tend towards disorder eventually, so what happens if computing systems become that? So he kind of pioneered the idea that this might exist. And then that was further out by like in the 1960s, um, you know, you heard a Turing experiment where machines can actually have some kind of emotional intelligence. Um, this guy called Weizen Weizenbaum actually came out with this um, computer psychotherapist and that's when people started to freak out because they started forming like intimate connections with the computer and they started questioning themselves like, you know, if computers actually have intelligence, what does that mean for us and how far should we push it? So that also led to the 19... Actually, 1970s around here, where this person called Mena started the, the term computer ethics. So she wrote a book around computer ethics itself, and that was followed up in the 1980s by finally a lady who wrote about computer ethics. Um, so this was a brief history of where it came from. And I think from there on, that's where we get to the next part where we recognize more. This is where it really started to blow up in the tech industry. Um, you can see 2007 was still very early on conversations about people starting to call out the fact that sometimes tech in tech is not very inclusive. Um, it seems like we see the same personas all the time. It was mostly, as you saw from my previous slide, it, it was mostly white males um, who are more senior. And so we needed more diversity in the tech industry. Um, 2011, you know, Women Who Code was founded, and I'm sure we all know Women Who Code. Um, we also had like Ellen Powell calling out her VC in Silicon Valley for harassment, which was actually very new at that point in time. Like, a lot of people didn't know about it, they thought she was crazy. She did eventually lose the settlement, but she said it was worth it. And you know, now she's the CEO of one of the CEOs, I think, of Reddit. So yeah, she's doing really well for herself. Um, there's also things that came up, like I know the subtitles are blocking, but this one actually talks about beware, uh, being, be, being aware of the bias that might come into AI if we don't develop solutions that factor in diversity. So if your AI is based on looking at a lot of white males as your recruitment process, as your main database, then what happens when it channels the next predictive model for like churning out the next um, potential candidates that you want to hire? So then you have even more white males and then we will not get diversity in that space. Um, you know, and then also today we see all these communities popping up, not so much organizations, but it's really taken a global phenomenon for, you know, different communities to pop up. So if you look behind me, you'll see Backstage Capital covering underrepresented groups, Trans Tech Social covering the non-binary or trans community, Tech Ladies, Women Who Code, that's right here in Singapore, and also um, just bring out Female Geek in Indonesia and also LGBT um, in tech in Auckland. So these are just some examples. Of course, I just want to show how it, trend, it goes across the spectrum. It's not just um, race, it's not just gender, there's actually a lot more. Okay, so um, I'll talk about really three main areas really briefly, just to give you a taste and just to give you a sense of what I've learned through or my experience, and then uh, feel free to then learn more on your own. So I'll talk about diversity and inclusion first. Um, just, you know, I'm sure all of you recognize these terms, right? Women in tech, people of color, accessibility in tech, LGBTQIA+. 
anyone has knows any other diversity terms that they've heard or you know that is not listed here? Any anyone from the room? No? Yeah, okay. Well there's a lot more than this actually. Um so initially when I first started out in this space thing, like okay, I started raising my hand for things at Microsoft, like, okay, I wanna try like doing women in tech stuff, you know, I, I want to try to be more diverse and inclusive. I was like, oh, it's quite simple, right? There's only like four categories, there's not so many things. But then suddenly when I started researching, I was like, oh my god, <laughs> there's a lot. So, I mean, there are a lot more things to address. There's equal pay, I think minorities, um, non-binary. Uh, for the case of Singapore, SES is also an issue. Um, yeah, rural communities, working mothers, working fathers, there's a lot more than we think. Um, this list is not exhaustive, there's a lot more than that. But the point of this is that it's not a finite goal, there's never a finite goal, there will always be new categories popping up. Um, the idea is just to really keep an open mind and also keep an open conversation. Um, you never know what the next, the next community or the next group that we need to think about and we might not even realise that but they might feel unincluded um, in the conversation. So I think in tech itself, um, you know, how are you always able to encourage that open conversation is a really important uh, point. Question. Yeah. Neurodiversity? Oh, neurodiversity is like... Um, the way that the brain functions. So the idea is that there are many different ways that it will, like personality or the way your brain thinks, the mental state that you're in, there's a whole different range as well. So that goes to another level, like you won't even realize it, right? Because they might look a certain way, but then how they process information might be different. So that's around neurodiversity. Yeah, I might be misrepresenting that, but please read out the proper definition, but that's generally the idea. Yes. So yes. So that it um, sort of to give you one example, for example, people who are on the spectrum when it comes to autism, yeah, generally um, do not Processes. have full-time stable jobs because it's people just assume that they can't focus as much, they can't contribute as much. So one of the things that neurodiversity falls under is things like yeah. spectrum, for example. Thank you. Yes, so that's, that's really good one. Um, so this is on diversity and inclusion. Um, next one, accessibility in tech. Um, there's a difference. So there's accessible tech and there's also assistive tech. So accessibility in tech, uh, you might hear the term often, but it doesn't just refer to people with disabilities. Um, it refers to just being making tech accessible for everyone. So think about things like, um, especially in a global team, I also realized that you know, language familiarity is a, is a thing. So you know, my Korean teammates, I need to speak like maybe one-tenth of the speed that I'm speaking at, just so that they understand what I'm saying. And, it goes both ways, right? So they also, like, sometimes, yeah, when they communicate back, they also have to check the way that they speak, or is there any way that they can add subtitles that make it easier for all of us to understand? So that's around accessible tech, and of course, assistive tech is around making technology that is more, um, that is easier to use for people with disabilities. So, you know, just simple things like knowing the difference. Um, each of these categories, there's a very different nature to each of them. Um, I would say don't go into each one thinking that, oh, okay, I need to define all the categories immediately, I need to... Um, yeah, it, the nature of it is always very different per category. So I think always reading up a little bit about that. So this is really just to start you off. Um, I did want to share this chart. I thought it was quite interesting around accessibility in tech. Um, this is a way to think about it. It's not the only way. Um, but that you can think about it in terms of, sorry, it's blocking. But <laughs> the subtitles are blocking. Um, but there's permanent, permanent, temporary, and situational. Um, states of the way that people are in and there's also you can also go by the way the senses go so touch see hear and speak so these are the w there's a way to turn the subtitling differently oh let me try huh? yeah subtitling settings and above slide uh, below slide below you try below I guess got it hello hello test test Okay, yeah. Okay, it is not accessible to anyone because you're blocking everything. But um, yeah, but you, you, you get my point. Um, this is some ways that you can think about it as well for when you're planning your events or you're planning your meetups or your hands on labs. Um, how do you consider all these factors? Okay, and I'll just give some examples. Um, yeah, so like what I spoke about earlier on, like people, assistive tech, people with disabilities. I think Google Maps is exploring, I don't know if it's available yet in Singapore, I didn't actually see it. Um, but they're exploring routes where you can actually take like accessible routes and you can choose that. I don't know, Googler, you might know. Is it available yet? I honestly don't know. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe in the U. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen it in any of the travel apps yet, but I know that this was talked about. Um, this was an example of us turning on live captions. So we try to caption everything that we have. 
um, my Korean teammate actually was the one that said like, you know, it's great that I can now read and understand your event better. Um, then the last, this last example over here is that, you know, thinking about accessibility also in rural communities, like especially with the coronavirus happening right now, um, internet broadband might not be available in more rural areas, so it might, must be a lot harder for them to attend virtual conference, so they can't even attend it at all, and that really affects the way of life. So how do you create solutions to solve these kind of issues? Okay, sustainability. I don't need to tell you how bad our world is at right now. Uh, I just need to show you a photo of like, if you can see Greta Thunberg and David Attenborough having a conversation, you know something is up. So um, just don't need any context there. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, these are just three ways that I see, well, so far the people that I've seen or the developers I've seen are embracing green. I think the green initiative is something still quite new in terms of solutions that we can come up with. So the problem isn't new because everyone talks about it nowadays, but the solution is still being formed. Um, just three simple steps that you know, I could propose is that firstly, aligning with green priorities. So as a developer coming up, um, how do you find organizations that have green priorities in mind? How do you find um, projects that have green priorities in mind? Um, secondly, environmentally responsible developer. So um, you can also like, I've shared some examples over here of like communities that you can search up and join on your own. Like they are active Slack groups talking about how they can be more um, environmentally friendly when they're developing their solutions. You know, how do you develop apps that consume less electricity, for example? Um, how do you have practices, best practices around not always traveling down for conferences? Because that actually consumes a ton of carbon. Can you do more virtual conferences even when it's not coronavirus time? Mm -hmm. Right, so these are, um, these are things that you can check out. Uh, oh, I also saw this, I thought it was quite cool. This, I saw this yesterday, it's about a search engine um, that is it's like a search engine that Google has now added to their Chrome features. But every search that you do helps to plan and send some money to help to plan a new tree. So it's pretty cool. I, I don't think it's as robust as Google, but yeah, they are eco-friendly, so you can check that out. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just want to share some ex examples of solutions that work for sustainability. So if you're thinking about, you know, another thing besides being responsible is also can you go above and beyond to come up with solutions that solve climate change issues. So um, just two examples of Microsoft AI for Good program. Um, we do sponsor and support AI, solution, uh, AI for good solutions, especially when they tackle climate change. So these are two examples that came out. One is TerraFuse, which actually looks at how to predict forest fires that are happening. So this is very relevant given the whole Australia situation that's happening. Um, another one is iNaturalist. So given conservation issues, um, how do you create consumer, like user-generated information where people can just use a smartphone and take and also um, help to identify the different species and using the cloud can actually create a repository of conservation species so that we can all, all be more aware. So these are just some examples you can think about. Last pillar, um, trust. So last of all, I think being ethical as well. Um, so these are around things that we should and we can and then should do, should or should not do. So around trust, um, just two resources that you can actually look at for Singapore's case. Uh, GDPR, I'm sure all of you have heard of GDPR. Anyone not heard of GDPR? Yeah, totally relevant. Uh, again, very globalized world now, so you never know if you have a European citizen in your audience. Um, best thing to do, especially if you're um, you know, going to collect private data through your app when they log in or register, how do you make sure that you adhere to these standards? And how do you make sure that everyone's very aware that they're opting in? So these are things that, like even in Microsoft, like, whenever I do an activity, it's actually a lot of work because we have to make sure that we comply by legal standards and compliance standards. So this is something that you would want to consider when building your solution. Okay, last one. Um, so just simple ways around <laughs> how you can also be an ethical developer, which is just according to me and not according to anyone else. So um, yeah, just take it as a reference point. Firstly, I think stay woke, which just means that read up on all these things that are happening. As I mentioned at the start, they can always change every month or every two months. So always read out in the news on what's happening so you get a gist of what the conversation is now about. Um, secondly, listen into multiple perspectives. So don't just take one source as the main truth. Um, don't even think my source is the main th truth. Listen to a few perspectives and form your own. Again, like on this space in ethics, I think it's very personal. So um, take some time to form your own opinion. I think that's the best way. Um, thirdly, be encourage open conversation. So any conversation they are in, I think keeping an open mind, open uh, open space for people to feel safe enough to share their views, that is in, in, in itself inclusive. So that's important. Um, and then fourthly, look for positive and negative examples. So 
in all the examples that I mentioned earlier on, there are examples that are negative where things have gone pretty bad, right? Like Cambridge Analytica, uh, sorry, Cambridge Analytic Analytica, where you know privacy was actually infringed on. Um, but there are also really positive examples around how people are going the extra mile, like the Ecosia search engine one. So look for good examples so that you can kind of model after it and have a good, have a better idea there. And lastly, be an advocate yourself. So just like myself, um, you know, sometimes it's not a formal role in your organization, but if you can build that into everything that you do, that will actually change the way that a lot of things are being built. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. Oh, any, any questions? No? OK, all good. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have. Uh, Is it changing laptop? Yeah, I think. Okay. I need it to be here on the live stream. Yeah, they keep it on. Hold it. Hold it. Yeah. Put it on this side. Yeah. Probably your. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. yeah. Just put it there. Okay. <coughs> <coughs>